Hello, I'm Marlene Spalton from the Community Foundation of Tampa Bay, and you're watching Tampa Bay Community Network. and this is Spotlight on Government. We're going to stray a bit from government today to one of the foundations in the area that helps people the way government should. We have with us today Marlene Spalton, who is the CEO of the Community Foundation of Tampa Bay. And that's a pretty big area, isn't it? It is, Bill. We actually serve four counties. Wow. Hillsborough, Pinellas, Pasco, and Hernando. D does Pasco hit the bay? <laughs> I don't know if they think so, but we're counting them in. We are <laughs> counting them in, yes. Well, that's wonderful. That, that is a really big area for a foundation to cover. Would you give me a little idea of what a foundation does as far as our counties are concerned? Well, we're a unique kind of foundation. So the Community Foundation of Tampa Bay is really a catalyst for strategic philanthropy. That's really what we do. Strategic philanthropy is different than charity. Uh, charity is a direct response to a need. Strategic okay, I've never heard that. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. They're really two different things, and we need both, you know, in, in our communities to make them healthy. Um, but strategic philanthropy, so the difference would be a hungry person giving a hungry person a bowl of soup. Uh -huh. That's charity. Okay. Providing a program where a person who's unemployed and having to uh, ask for food can get a job, be prepared for that, and be given employment, that's strategic philanthropy. Oh, so the, the idea is... A hand out and a hand up. That's eloquent, yes, okay. exactly. I wish I had said that. <laughs> As the CEO of this organization, what is your background? Where do you come from? How long have you been here? And what do you bring to the job? I've been working in philanthropy for actually my whole professional career, really? so okay. I, I don't want to tell you how many decades that is, but it's been a while. The past 10 years. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Um, and on both sides and in two different arenas before coming here, education at first where I worked and then in the health in healthcare. Um, just before coming here, I was at Baptist Health in Jacksonville, which is a, a system of five hospitals okay. uh, throughout the Jacksonville area. Um, so, and prior to that, I worked at independent schools uh, in education. So in both of those, I worked with philanthropists wanting to do good things for ed education or healthcare, and, uh, and also organizations that were, that considered themselves citizens of the community and needing to not only take care of those within their walls, but the community at large, knowing that that's really what they needed to do to fulfill their mission. So it really did lead into this even broader scope of the Community Foundation of Tampa Bay. A community foundation is, the concept was first born over 100 years ago. Really? The first one was started in Cleveland. Uh, it's still there. And Cleveland, it's Ohio? Cleveland, Ohio, okay. and it has assets of over a billion dollars at this point in time. Wow. There are now almost 100, 800 community foundations throughout the nation, and some internationally as well. And what distinguishes us from other kinds of foundations is that we are place-based in the sense that our expertise, our greatest interest is right where we live and work. Um, and hence the community foundation. We have two sides of our, of our business, so to speak. We provide services to philanthropists. We house donor advised funds, family foundations that can be housed under us so people don't have to create a private foundation, Com all kinds of community endowments, agency endowments, um, scholarships, we do all of that. So anything, anything really that a philanthropist wants to do, we can pretty much accommodate that way of getting. If, for instance, uh, God forbid, you had a child that was killed and you wanted to have some kind of endowment or something 
for that child. You could, I assume, go to your own attorneys and work it out. But that might be a problem in long term. Right. So if, if that wanted to, somebody wanted that to happen, they could come to you and get advice and counsel on how to make that happen? Yes. And I'm both proud as well as sad to say we have actually a good handful of funds that were set up just for that reason, to memorialize a child who had lost their life in some tragic accident. We're very proud to have the Schenecker Fund uh, with us that honors the two children of Colonel Schenecker, whose uh, wife actually killed those two children. Yeah. And it was such tragic, what a tragic, tragic thing. event. The absolutely um, incredible thing is how Colonel Schenecker has come back from that to devote his life to, the, to celebrating the lives, not the deaths, but the lives of his children through his foundation and good work, uh, through his foundation, we call it that, at the Community Foundation. Um, what we do in a case like that is provide the administrative support in the background so they're not worried about that. They can go about doing the, the good work that they want to do with their funds in the community uh, unhampered by the administrative work that's required if you have your own private foundation. Well, it seemed to me, too, that given the resources you have, if I went to an attorney and I said, set this fund up and administer it, the administrative costs would be much higher Absolutely. than if it went into something like this. We actually have a, a brochure that, with a full page of the differences between our family foundation program or a donor advised fund at the community foundation versus a private foundation. And we're hearing from our professional advisors that we work closely with throughout the region that certainly for assets under five million and even up to 10 million, Creating a private foundation is not the smartest or the wisest you know, way to go, but creating a fund at a community foundation uh, is, there, the rules are, are, are more favorable, it's less expensive, obviously, and you've got the help of the community foundation staff and trustees and other donors to help guide your, funder, your, your grant making. So that's the other side of our house. So while we're taking money in from philanthropists, inspiring philanthropy in the community on this side, we have our whole grant making side of the community foundation. And what we do on that side is help specific donors with their grant making. We do everything from taking them on site visits to organizations they might be interested in funding, educating them about issues in the community and in the region that we're in. Um, as well as putting them together with other philanthropists who are interested in this same cause. Um, but we also are managing those funds left to us, oftentimes in estate plans, uh, from very generous people who love their community and who leave those monies for the good of the community in some way. Our community leaders, our grants committee folks, they determine how best to use those funds every year. And so that's our grant making side. And that's where we acquire great knowledge about the community. Um, we know who all the nonprofits are. We know who's leading them. We know what special projects they're getting ready to launch. We know which ones are working together on something. We encourage all of that and support that. So that's this side of the house. And you can see how they complement one oh, another. Oh, I would think so, yes. Yeah. So and, and we're not only talking about people that have five, six, seven million dollars. We're talking no. about mom and dad that maybe they don't have any children. They just they just didn't choose to have children. They don't have any favorite nieces and nephews. Right. But they'd like to leave something behind with their name on it. Exactly. The minimum to establish a donor advised fund is ten thousand dollars. Is that all? For I mean, an endowment. It's all, it's, uh, you honestly, could do that. Ten thousand dollars <laughs> is a lot of money. I, I'm not. I don't. Not, yeah. But but yes. that's. It's small in comparison to what we've been talking about, five, six, seven million. Exactly. Uh, an endowment is 25000 So for those minimal amounts of money, uh, again, not that they're insignificant, sure. uh, and they grow over time. So a big part of what we do, kind of underlining both these two sides of the house that we talked about, is our management, our financial management. Because we're pulling together the philanthropy of hundreds of people, 
into one big pool of money that we're then putting into investments. We're able to get into institutional funds. We're able to hire uh, top-notch consulting and managers for our funds. Do you have your funds. own investment counselors on staff, yes. or do you go out? AGW is our investment consultants, and they hire managers from all over the country who are managing funds. Okay. Um, and our consultants report quarterly to our investment committee made up of knowledgeable leaders in, in the field. Uh, as to their progress, there's benchmarks that they need to meet and indexes that funds are compared against. So your, your monies are growing as, as they're deposited at the community foundations. I'm assuming that there is a fairly strong reporting function yes. so that if somebody wanted to look into it and see, uh, for instance, how much was spent on administration versus yes. uh, dispensing, that those, those numbers would be out there. Absolutely, we pride ourselves on that. And this community foundation in particular has a really strong reputation for being good stewards of the monies that have been deposited, invested in us. And that's what we, how we talk about them. It's donors investing in their community. It's us investing those dollars uh, for growth so that they can, at the same time, give money away every year while the corpus of their fund continues to grow. So this becomes bigger and bigger uh, over time. So it's not a matter of you give $25,000 and you want to give a scholarship to somebody every year. It's not like it's every $5,000 and it's gone? No, it's invested and it grows. And with prudent management, as well as you know, giving away the right amount each year, and our finance committee makes that recommendation each year to our board, that will happen. Your fund will grow, while at the same time you're giving money away. Can someone, as an example, give you $25,000 and say, I'd like every year uh, to a senior from Earl Leonard High School or Lakeland High School or whatever, uh, I'd like to see them get a thousand dollar sure type board. We hold a number of scholarships for all different reasons and purposes. So um, I can be that specific. Oh yeah. When I mm -hmm. give you the money. Right. And we work with donors as we're creating each each gift comes in with a fund agreement and we work with donors to make sure that that, that written agreement uh, accurately reflects what their intentions are and that it's administratable over the long term. So if you made uh, your request so specific that we would have concerns about how that might be administered 30 or 50 years from now, we would advise you about that. A, a redheaded child with pimples right. and, and <laughs> getting, getting a little too specific. But, right. but someone living in Carrollwood, for instance, mm -hmm. could say, I want this money spent on these purposes in Carrollwood. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. And we do have a number of funds of people that have done that. There are, uh, down in South County and Sun City Center, mm -hmm. there are a number of funds uh, that people are very grateful for that community and being a part of that toward the ends of their lives. They've left their monies uh, for the residents of Sun City Center. Uh, one of our our most exciting ones is the Petro Fund. Mary Petro was a longtime yes. resident yes, yes. of I knew Sun her. City. You knew her? Yes. Oh, I wish what I had lady. known her. And she left uh, a sizable uh, fund for just food and medicine for people in Sun City Center in Kings Point. And every month we give away eight to ten thousand uh, dollars to people who have need for food and medicine. So that's wow. And her, that will go on forever. It allows her fund to continue to grow, as I said. And the amount that, that's able to be distributed as the corpus grows will be greater and greater, too. So what that's an incredible legacy. It um, is. A man told me just the other day, I have to share this with you, Bill, that um, he, has, he has assets that and some funds with us. Uh, at one point, we were going through the details because we'll review those periodically sure. with people. And they were in front of him as two different funds, one that he currently uses and then one that his money's going to go to after he dies. And he said, you know, I, when I die, I just want to be cremated. I don't care about a funeral. 
and I certainly don't want a tombstone. These are my tombstones. Yeah. That's his legacy. Yes. And I thought it yes. was such, yes. I said, can I quote you A living over? legacy. Because it's just exactly. He will always be remembered. His name and his wife's name, who's now deceased, is on his fund. And every time we make a grant out of his fund, it'll be, we'll, we'll name him and his wife as the beneficiaries of that fund. So it's a wonderful way to think about living on and on. You know, you mentioned Sun City Center, and mm -hmm. there's going to be a pilot program down in South County that you're getting started on. In fact, that's how we met, and I that's invited right. you to come to the show. Right. My wife, Phyllis, wrote an article on it, and I said, gee, this would be a great show. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit that pilot program, because this is applicable not only to Sun City Center area with, with the Community Association and Kings Point and Freedom Plaza and that area there, but it's also going to be applicable to other areas because in the word pilot, that means there's going to be others following it. So follow along and we'll talk a little bit about what this program is going to bring to Sun City and what it might bring to your areas. So would you like to discuss with me a little bit about what your plan sure, is there? Sure. In order to be effective in such a broad geographic footprint, we've established regional councils. And there's one in South Hillsborough County. We say south of the Alifaya River. And that and council... Rick, Rick Rios, Rick Rios kind of handles that. Yes, he's the council okay. chair. And he uh, runs that council and leads that council and is also then a member of our board. We have another regional council for Pinellas County, the Pinellas Council, mm -hmm. and we have one called the Pasco Hernando Council. Okay. And those three council chairs also serve as trustees on our board. But they give us, they and the council they convene, give us real, you know, in-depth and intimate knowledge of communities in which they serve that it's hard to do for any small staff or any small board of trustees. The group down there decided they really wanted some real data about what the basic needs are and the most pressing basic needs for Sun City Center. We know there are people that are food insecure. We know that there are people that don't have transportation. We know that there are people that are suffering from the loneliness of Many aging. Many of them have outrun their, quite honestly, a lot of these people retired, thought they had plenty, and of course with the dip where the stock market went out, they had to still live on those funds, and now they don't have enough anymore. Exactly, and with families dispersed, uh, as we know, more than they, they were you know, when I was growing up or um, some time ago, it, it makes it exacerbates the problem. So we worked with, we are working with the University of South Florida uh, researchers to do a, an in-depth research study of the basic needs in Sun City Center and Kings Point. We, refined, we, def, uh, we defined it as that, that area that we wanted because we wanted uh, to be able to, to really get some data we thought would be interesting on just that community, not all of the county, which is very diverse, of course, and, right. and so on. So the, the study is underway. Um, they created a, a model that we signed on to, and one of the first things that were done, uh, our council recommended stakeholders for them to interview to get a real flavor for the area. Um, they did those stakeholder interviews. That led to a community-wide meeting. We invited the whole community. And you had a nice turnout. We had a great turnout and great questions from the people attending, not just about the study, but you know, suggestions about be sure you talk to people that are handicapped. They have right. a whole different set of challenges than the rest of us. Uh, be sure you talk to veterans and the services or their accessibility of services to veterans in our area. Yeah, it's um, a 45 minute drive from Sun City Center exactly. up to the, to the uh, VA. VA. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that can be even worse during bad traffic times if so, you went up there at nine in the morning. Right, so we're trying to identify what are the real specific needs of this community. It's to inform our grant making. It's data that we'll share with anyone who's interested. So when you talked in the opening about government, and we really like working alongside government. Um, we're very much in touch with government leaders, uh, 
we want to be aligned with what priorities are, what government's investing money in, and invest alongside. Well, you don't want to be at a counterpoint, for sure. Exactly, no. And that's when we're at our best, I think. When we can bring the different sectors together um, to work on, on issues, that's when you can really um, get so traction. So how will this work out? You had, you had the initial meeting, and then you had this open meeting, and in that meeting you indicated you were going to try to develop some some groups that would be focus groups. Uh, how are you going to choose the people to be in these focus groups? The focus groups uh, will be selected by uh, the council and a group of people, small group of people from the stakeholder uh, references that we feel know the community broadly. We don't want just one kind of people, one group of people that live in a certain neighborhood and so on to be representative. We want it to be broadly representative. And I can't say enough about, uh, we're working with Dr. Robin Ersing and her team. Uh, they're fabulous and they, you know, they're teaching us so much along the way as well. And that's an important part of this project. Certainly. Um, people think of Sun City Center as a retirement area, but in my experience with Community Foundation, we've been able to really be ahead of things down there. We've been able to, um, to, to try new things down in Sun City Center that have been successful that we then can apply to other areas. To your point earlier then, um, what if already the way this is going has given us a real thirst to do these kinds of specific studies in other communities that we serve as well. So it's a learning exercise for us. The focus groups will be formed. Once that data, there will be 11 of them. Once those focus groups and the data is collected from them, the researchers will analyze all of that and put it in a report, hold another public community meeting to share the analysis and that data. So it's a, it's a great uh, project. It's put us in touch with some really wonderful people. The key will be to choosing those 11 groups. Yes, and the community the helped us. How many us people will be in each of those 11 eight groups? Eight to 10. The focus groups will be about eight to 10. They'll be interviewed by Dr. Ersing for about an hour and a half each, and, um, and then that information will all be pulled together, and the researchers will analyze it. It'll be interesting. For those of you who don't know Sun City Center, there are really three entities down there. There's Kings Point, which is a gated community. There's a community association side, which is ungated, and then there's Freedom Plaza, which is more of a, it's kind of a buy-in condo organization that was originally started for military. Yes. And it's very high-end people. So there's a lot of diversity there is. in that area. We think, too, that the nature so of this- So it'll be a good test. It'll be a good <laughs> test. And we think because of the nature of, this, of these communities, that this study might be valuable for others who are in the industry of retirement communities. Sure. You know, what makes them thrive? You know, what are the challenges faced by people who, who live in those communities? So, we, you know, we've, we've already got connections, for example, to, you know, organizations like AARP or other organizations that really might, we think, have an interest in, in the study. Of course, all the input is anonymous. We don't name those who contribute. Um, and we really hope everyone will be candid and open and thoughtful about their participation. Do you have an end game here? What, you get all this information. Uh, there was a study down in Sun City Center, and they got all this information. And then, then it sat on the shelf. It's still sitting down there in the library. Uh, is there an end game here for your organization? You're better able to implement at least what's given than what we got before. We make two kinds, two, two primary kinds of grants. One are, we call those competitive grants, where we're just responding to proposals that we receive. But the other, an increasingly larger uh, focus for us, are what we call our initiatives, our grant making initiatives, where we identify a problem in the community. We identify people who are trying to work on that problem and solve that. We learn about it. Where are gaps? Is there something we can do to help lever leverage change in that with not just our, our financial uh, capital, but other forms of capital that we have, social and reputational and our networks and those kinds of things. If, 
is it helpful for us to bring that to bear on this specific issue? And then we move forward with that. We are doing that here in all of Hillsborough County with uh, LEAP, Hillsborough College Access Network, um, that has adopted goal 2025. That goal is to increase the number of working age adults in Hillsborough County to 60% uh, to having college degrees or professional certification to 60% of our population. Well, that'd be nice. That'd be nice. It'd be quite a jump from where we are, quite a leap from where we are now. We're uh, you know, hovering around the low 40%. We know that by 2025, we're gonna need people who have college degrees or advanced post-secondary education of some this form. This is becoming a hotbed of technology. Yes, and you can't do that without Mark Sharp is really pushing technology, he technology. Is. He's doing a great, up in the university area, yep. yes. Um, so now if we can get people to work back and forth by having a decent transit system. Transportation. Of course, you don't have anything to do with that. Well. Well, maybe you do, I don't know. You know, we're just, it's funny you bring that up because we've, we're just, in fact, I was in a conversation with Sandy Merman this morning um, about that issue and she you know said when I asked her what's on the top of your mind that was you know one thing that she mentioned um, we're we worried to do something we're worried about poor people when you think about even how hard it is for us at times to get around sure. if you have no car and you're trying to go to school to better yourself and you've got children that have to be dropped off at a daycare center that's you know, we have we know clients that are spending three, four, five hours on buses to make that all work, which doesn't isn't you know well, long term. You don't solution. have to be poor. I was my wife and I were asked to come to a meeting out by the airport the other day. It was going to be at six o'clock, <laughs> and I just said no. It'll Can't take me there. two hours to get there. I'm yeah. not going. Yeah. If we had a decent transit system, I could get on that. We could zip out to the airport get to where we needed to go. Marlene Spelton, thank you for coming on thank the program, you. CEO of the Community Foundation for Tampa Bay. I want to have you back. Will you come back? I would love that. Thank I'd you. I'd love Bill. to have some more information on all the things you're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Bill Hodges. This is Spotlight on Government. You're unique, you're special, and you're great. Tell yourself so often because you are, you know. We'll see you on the next Spotlight of Government. And again, Marlene, thank you for being with us. You thank brought you. a lot of information to our program.